society. He is a great academician and researcher. He is the education chair of Indian Society of European Research and reviewer of famous journals like BJJ, SICOT, and our own Indian Journal of Orthopedics. He has over 115 research papers and 28 book chapters to his credit. He has delivered the IOA Silver Jubilee Oration in the year 2015 and has been a doctorate guide and PG teacher of Maharashtra University of Health Sciences. Today is the day of controversies in pediatric disorder. We have our eminent speaker, Dr. Rujuta Mehta, ma'am, and moderators, Dr. Sasa Matyas, Dr. Rama Priya, and Dr. Niti Sarora. I would now like to call upon Dr. Mahanti to introduce our speaker and the moderators and proceed to us with the session. Dr. Mahanti, sir, all to you now. Sir. Yeah. So good evening to you all. Welcome to the fourth uh, episode of uh, Controversies and Consensus in Orthopedics. So we have been conducting last uh, three episodes have been uh, very popular and you have been getting some of the feedbacks and people are enjoying. So today we'll have you know, consensus, controversy and consensus in pediatrics. And uh, we have uh, one eminent speaker, uh, Dr. Rujita Mehta, who is here. And I'll just share my screen. Okay. Okay. So, Dr. Rujita Mehta is not unknown to Indian orthopods. Uh, she is the Head of the Department of Biogeer uh, by Wadia Hospital for Children in Mumbai and the consultant orthopedic surgeon in uh, many hospitals starting from the north to south Mumbai like uh, Nanamati, Jaslok, Surya Child Care and whatnot. Uh, Dr. Mehta has been the distinction of Chair of Women Orthopedic Surgeons of India, Collective Empowerment and Chair of WAVES, that, that is women, women of uh, Asia Pacific Orthopedic Association Advocate, Educate and Support. She was the BOS secretary and I would say that she was the most dynamic secretary of Bombay Orthopedic Society from 2018 to 2020 and vice president in 2021 to 22. She has been the section editor in Pediatric Orthopedics, JOIO, JO, Journal of Orthopedics, JORAP, Wadia Journal. And she has been active also in the editorial board of IJPO. And I've been a reviewer of uh, Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics B. And she's a very close friend and we have been, we are working together in Bombay Hospital during our residency days as well. And I still remember that uh, she's one of the very active, uh, you know, orthopods uh, in Bombay Orthopedic Society as well as Indian Orthopedic Association. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rujita, joining today and welcome to you to this show. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohanty. It's a real pleasure. And um, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very good idea to discuss a focused topic with its controversies and consensus, because controversies, if discussed in a healthy way, they are thought provoking. And that is what finally enables a consensus building, because consensus building is the only way forward, as I would look at it. And I, I think no other topic that came to my mind would be of interest to everyone uh, except club food because I think each and every one of us, even if we are arthroplasty surgeons yeah. or uh, uh, you know trauma surgeons or scopy, at some point we have dealt with club food. And it's some, somehow it's so fascinating yeah. that even in the pediatric world, despite being the most discussed topic, it is still important, it still has relevance and it, it still holds interest. So and very you. glad before, that you... Yeah, before... Me, before I hand over to you, I'll just uh, introduce our moderators. Sure. So two new moderators and there have been many, many more women and they are all bright. And I'm sure they'll prove their worth in years to come. Thanks. We welcome Dr. Sasha Matthias. Uh, she is MS Orthopedics from Bharti Vidyapat Medical College and Hospital Sangli. Uh, and she is the university gold medalist in orthopedics as well. And at present, she is a senior registrar at uh, you know, Bharti Vidyapat Sangli as well. And so we'll have some, you know, 
young people who are there around to just discuss about uh, you know club for today in addition to that we have dr ramapriya yasham who is ms orthopedics and mcs in pediatric orthopedics from ams rishikesh and working as assistant professor in bcs gmc medical college srinagar uttarakhand welcome dr rama and dr sasha today to work as moderators and in addition to that we our own dr nit Tish Arora, who is the MS Orthopedics from PGSP Mirrors and uh, DNB Fellow in Assami, EO faculty, Assami faculty and former senior registrar at All India Institute in New Delhi, currently working as consultant pediatric orthopedics at Medicover Hospital, Navi, Mumbai. So we welcome our moderators as well. Now, without any further ado, uh, let, let me hand over to Dr. Rujita to deliver his, uh, you know, lecture on uh, club food, the controversy and consensus. Over to Dr. Rujita. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohanty. Um, is my screen visible? Yeah. yeah. Great. So then I'll go to the first slide and I'll go on to the full share screen mode. So since Clubfoot is something all of us really uh, have dealt with at some point in time, we know how worried the parents are and uh, what kind of uh, stress it causes to uh, the whole family. So I'll start with this adage that Dr. Ignacio Ponsetti, the uh, absolute legend in club food treatment has given. Uh, he likes to tell the parents that your child is perfect. We only have to straighten his little feet. Of course, a master like him would trivialize something which is a huge endeavor and has invoked lots and lots of types of treatment. Because why is that so? Because the spectrum itself is large and that is from a classical idiopathic or a, uh, you know, a supple club foot as you would see here to a postural club foot. It could be an isolated anomaly or part of a syndrome or with many other anomalies. And therefore there is lots that goes into how this anomaly is treated. And especially in India, it's uh, the Western world sees it more as babies. But we still deal with a spectrum which is a little more different and a little more challenging, right from neuromuscular to a strangely even a three-year-old walking club foot, which may be supple, and rigid club feet and syndromes like this, and even adults who, because of social stigmas, come late to us. So therefore, we, one has to be like a juggernaut and one has to pr practically know every trick in the book to be able to deal with this in a successful manner. So let's try and see some of the things that I've learned and shared my journey with. And you all are free to kind of, you know, it's meant more to be a discussion or a dialogue between peers. So feel, please feel free to send us lots of questions. So why do we say that Clubfoot is also full of controversies? Well, to begin with the etiology itself or why is Clubfoot called, which is the commonest question that most uh, parents will ask you. That itself is not established as a 100% correlation yet. You can see from the list here, uh, right from the arrest in embryonic development to a different type of myofibril cells and tendons and ligaments uh, to a primary germplasm defect to a simple packaging defect or a neuromyogenic imbalance. Somehow, the posterior medial aspect of the uh, child's foot gets deformed and continues to pose a challenge right from birth to 18 years of age. Finally, what the consensus in these terms has been is that uh, club foot is a thought of to be a multifactorial origin, uh, right from a packaging defect to actual genetics. And there is a lot of basic science research still going on around the world. Hopefully we will be isolating a gene sometime in future and be able to prevent it antenatally. As regards the pathoanatomy and intraosseous as well as interosseous issues, again, there has been a lot of literature, a lot of uh, uh, interplay of discussion that has happened. But I think this is what uh, really revolutionized the concept of the thinking or it forms the core or the central idea of understanding how a club foot is. Of course, there are, there's great work like Farabuff and uh, many other researchers who've gone into it since Hippocrates, but let me take you a little bit into detail about what the concept of the Astabellus DD is. It was described by Scarpa in 1808, and he said you need to pay a lot of attention as to what deformity goes in here. 
that is between the navicular and anterior and middle facets of the calcaneum, where it gets displaced in relationship to the cuboid. And the dorsal part of the spring ligament, which is the first deforming force, then starts pulling it away uh, and not holding into the acetabulum. This talus then almost acts like a femoral head. And therefore, the acetabulum pedis is the concept of the name which they gave it. And if you then draw a simile between DDH and the uh, club foot, then this is all about really containing that head into the acetabulum pedis or its socket by a series of rotations and many other complex bio uh, interlinked kinematics, which we'll talk about when we actually talk about the Ponseti technique. Uh, if anybody is interested more, they can really dive deep into it and read up this uh, book by Vincent Mosca, where he has really described this entire pathoanatomy absolutely in detail. So what happens here? There is a deformation between the calcanopedial unit, which is the, uh, what is it? It's all the bones of the foot except the talus and the toes, and the subtalar joint, that's the joint between the calcanopedial unit and the talus. The whole interplay or the problems uh, or the deformities occur here, which are in, it is inverted, adducted, and plantar flexed and in supination. So if you compare this to a ringing towel, you will see that between here, the middle aspect and this, there are three planes which actually come into picture all in relationship with each other. And therefore, a club foot is known to be a multi-apical deformity. Uh, and consequent to this, there's a pronation of the forefoot and which leads to progressive spring ligament contracture, which leads to a gradual subluxation. So when you look at the normal foot and the tripod, which it is supposed to form between the two heads of the, both the metatarsals, the talus and the hind foot, this tripod gets unbalanced. It rotates here as the fulcrum. And this concept is vital to the understanding of the Ponseti technique, that if you really realize that the kinematics of these three joints, and if you derotate it back around this, your entire mid tarsal joints, the forefoot and the intermetatarsal joints, everything falls back into place. And that's why Ponseti was such a master. He uh, really contributed a lot to the world of pediatric orthopedics by all his work in uh, University of Iowa and conducted extensive anatomic studies on uh, uh, fetal cadavers and analyzed the kinematics of the foot and devised his technique based on the following principle, that the creep or the viscoelastic property of collagen, which is there in neonates because these children are supple, they still have the effect of the maternal hormone relaxin, can stretch out even a very complex multi deformity like a rubber band. And then we have to retain it and uh, we pre-stretch the foot prior to casting. And if it is done gently and regularly and in a sustained fashion, with the help of the of open principle of growing cartilage, you can actually reshape and align the cartilage in these joints by sequentially bringing the foot back into normal alignment. Of course, the only problem or the challenge here remains the tendo Achilles, which has dense thick collagen fibers, not amenable to stretching, and therefore, as an essential or integral part of the Ponseti technique, you need to do a TA tenotomy. So here is the master himself showing you how the talus is out of the acetabulum pedis and completely dislocated. That's the midfoot, which is inverted and adducted. And that's the forefoot, which is relatively pronated in relationship to the hind foot. And that's Dr. Ponseti himself showing you the uh, Ponseti technique of manipulation, which uh, is OPD based, it has eased out the treatment completely. So why was Ponseti method different and why was it so successful? And if you follow it exactly the way the master has described it, the order of correction is very, very important. We already told you that the fulcrum is on the uh, subtalar joint complex. So that's your subtalar joint complex. If one finger is put on that and the other finger or the other hand actually manipulates the forefoot and gradually brings it out into abduction, going into uh, the talus, then goes back, slips back into the acetabulum pedis and in the, within the ankle mortis. And that you can see sequentially in diagrams here from complete inversion to full abduction. Similarly, correspondingly, you can see in the plasters where you bring it out in a weekly rhythm, gradually into 
the first cast, second cast, third, fourth, and fifth, how the entire forefoot and midfoot complex moves out. And the same can be very elegantly seen in these bone models here, where this is the first cast or the correcting, uh, raising the, you know, eliminating the cavus component, then starting your gradual abduction, bringing it out in abduction. And you can see that the abduction is really occurring here and the talus is gradually sinking in. And what is beautiful is, although nothing is being done to the hind foot, everything that you're doing manipulating is being done here. This is how, if you can see the long axis of the talus, how beautifully it is moving from inversion to neutral and back into the socket into a normal valgus, which you and I have. The beauty of this technique is that it's very easily done in a quiet baby, hardly takes 10 to 15 minutes in experienced hands. Once you reach this stage of a completely lateral straight border, you go ahead with the tenotomy, which can be done under local. Uh, nowadays, we don't even take a stitch really onto it. And that's a beautiful correction. And after retention, this is how well the child can look. So are we saying that we've really found a panacea and all is well? Not really. Uh, it, Ponsetti himself experienced a huge uh, problem in people accepting his technique until his uh, long-term results were proven. Because there were a lot of people who are doing it in traditional ways and the uh, uh, typical popular method in those days was Kite's method. Again, the sequen here, sequence here was CAVE, C-A-V-E. Cavus, adductus, varus, and uh, uh, equinus. So uh, more or less the thinking was the same and they would correct each component in the serial order. But it was difficult to reproduce the results as successful as Ponsetti. There were more number of casts required. And the biggest problem, as we saw, the famous kites error is you can see where the hands are being placed here. This was blocking the calcaneocuboid joint. And therefore, the calcaneocuboid joint, which was the fulcrum, was causing a break here. And therefore, the entire foot was not falling back into place as elegantly or as simply as it happens in the Ponsetti. And therefore, the correction would come only up to neutral. Correction very often had to be forced. And you, you couldn't get a dorsiflexion of the ankle uh, unless you did either a posterior release. Especially, this was very difficult in syndromic and rigid feet. And you had to give a force post-correction, which again resulted in a stiffer foot. So, is there enough evidence uh, to support this controversy and conclusively say that, yes, now the consensus is more in favor of Ponsetti? Most certainly, yes. And this has been proven by a number of studies where that the Ponsetti technique is more effective, it's faster, less casts, better ankle movements, and lesser need for further surgery. What is the evidence in its favor when they compared Ponsetti with traditional techniques? That is the traditional plastering techniques. And a open surgery. They saw uh, this famous paper, if you just go back to the Herzenberg paper, the need for further, further surgery was reduced to only 3% as compared to the traditional techniques where most of them, I mean, this is huge. The difference is really, um, you know, eye-catching. And that's why the world took notice of this as a long-term technique. And the controversy shifted in favor to a consensus uh, for Ponsetti technique all over the world. Again, why is it a landmark? Because not only the immediate results, but even the long-term results of 45 patients, even 30 years after treatment, they had great pain, uh, no pain and great function compared with subjects who did not have club foot. Good to excellent outcome, almost in the 78% uh, uh, children treated by the Ponsetti technique, almost as good as a no club foot group. Yeah. So uh, this was uh, literally the paper that shook the pediatric orthopedic world and took the controversy away and gave us consensus. Ponsetti was the surgery, again, in the same uh, group of researchers. This is what they looked up. As compared to the PMR group, 62% had a great outcome with Ponsetti, whereas the PMR uh, group, sadly enough, which is what was practiced uh, uh, some time back, had only 4% uh, uh, good outcomes and excellent 22. So collectively, not really measuring up to, again, the balance tilted more in favor of the Ponsetti technique. And what's even better that this has been validated by MRI studies by none other than Shafiq Pirani, who is just uh, another uh, you know, uh, living legend or just as good 
I mean, you know, probably taken the legacy of Dr. Ponsetti further, but he has shown with MRI studies that this is absolute restoration of the anatomy before and after, and again, the hind foot before and after. So when you look at this axis, this is absolutely like a normal foot. And again, the uh, midfoot and the tail, subtalar joint is completely well aligned. Well, talking of Pirani, he since uh, he's uh, had a great contribution in the world of uh, club foot scoring. This was a score originally developed uh, for neonates, but still it is the most popular or most in vogue scoring, which is uh, now followed by every practically every paper who wants to study club foot. So therefore, it has been a little controversial that is it really reliable or is it, uh, uh, you know, really accurately re uh, reproducible or usable in older children. But again, because it is so easy, because it is so simple, it has a good intra-observer reliability. And bec because it is it's, it's a dynamic assessment, plus it's something which analyzes severity as well as outcome. I think the balance is really very uh, well done over here that most of you are familiar this, with this score, but this is absolutely the scoring method now used by consensus. There are Demeglio scores, there are uh, Paver scores and many other ICFSG scores, lots of scores which exist in Clubfoot. But I think by and large, we, what has stood the test of time and now is literally popular all over the world is the Pirani technique of scoring Clubfoot. So the tenotomy, again, one more part of the club foot, which was, uh, you know, a lot of parents are hesitant towards it. And there have been attempts to try and show that whether can we do away without the tenotomy. But to my mind, this is a uh, very, very imperative as a part of the uh, club foot treatment to do a full and complete tenotomy. And what we like to tell the parents is this is the spring, which if not released will lead to an entire relapse. So when you look at what is a conventional tenotomy, this is done with a surgical blade after local infiltration. You should do it only after achieving an abduction of 60 degrees or a full uh, lateral border straightening as given in the Pirani score. Many have some complications if it's not done properly. Uh, this is done one inch or one finger breadth above the uh, crease of the calcaneum or the insertion of the tendocalculus. And it is the completeness is defined by ability to dorsiflex at least to 20 degrees. You should feel a sudden pop and a palpable gap in the tendon itself. It's percutaneous. It's very easy to do even in a clinic. And you should double check by doing the Thompson's test. So why did this become uh, controversial? Because the whole treatment was so simplified. So therefore, there was a hesitancy towards to even using a, a knife and especially in developing countries and other uh, circumstances when it was being done even as a outreach method. So therefore Murano et al developed this technique by uh, using a small 18 gauge needle, which is as good as a small knife for a baby who is really young. And they said, when you can look at it percutaneously palpate it, just use the bevel of the needle as a sharp 11 number blade. And uh, this was reported by Murano et al. Uh, although I think both the techniques, the consensus is that they are equally valid, it's best to undergo a certain amount of training. There is a significant learning curve and finally use what is in your hands. There is still some discussion in the pediatric orthopedic world about uh, if it's done for now that since sponsority is uh, technique is being used or serial casting is being used for uh, um, bigger and bigger children. We'll come to it in some time. Should it be the same as it was used in neonates or should there be some other techniques? And there is very li limited evidence in literature for the upper limit. And therefore, we are, uh, and also the worry or the concern, the naysayers of Ponsetti always said that the TA may not regenerate completely in older children and therefore you may be left with some residual weakness. I would say that this is a controversy under study. We are looking at it at the Baijar by Wadia Children's Hospital and we've been using it on older children. Uh, and we measured it by uh, using active uh, ankle motion and looking at the tendo Achilles power, doing an active heel raise test, as well as ultrasonographic. So anatomic as well as radiologic evidence of completeness. And this is what you can see over here, completely regenerated tendo Achilles 
three months after the uh, surgery, both in the longitudinal and in the sagittal plane. Again, you can see a full dynamic continuity there, very similar to as if the tenotomy had not been done. So this is a controversy we hope to settle with a prospective study and show that it is as good as a, a conventional tenotomy in a neonate. We come to the next part of Ponsetti where everybody thought that yes, it works in the master's hand, but what about everyone else who is learning it? So is there, uh, it's, is it all a utopia? Is it all gung-ho? No, there is uh, the real but very treatable danger of causing an iatrogenic club, uh, atypical club foot. So atypical club foot now is a nomenclature given to something which is caused as a result of serial casting, where you use either too much padding or you don't mold the cast well, the foot slips upward and the foot deformity is made worse. Sounds shocking? Let me show you how it's made worse. This is how a child's club foot, which was nice and supple, ends up looking with very badly deformed plantar creases. This is the phenomenon of what now is known, very well known and accepted as plantaris, where you have a deep plantar crease stretching all across the midfoot. You have a short and cocked up gray toe, which was always considered a sign of bad prognosis. And you also have apparent tibial bowing. If you look at it radiologically, this is how a plantaris looks. You can see the midfoot break here and the complete drop of all four or five metatarsals. This is a picture under uh, C arm. And you can see that the hind foot does not participate at all. In fact, the equinus has not been treated, period. And it's the entire forefoot which now requires a separate maneuver to treat it all together. And you can see it so elegantly in the 3D CT scans, where this is the hind foot and then you have a complete plantaris or a drop of all five metatarsals. How does it look clinically? You will see a rigid equinus because the heel has got squashed since it got pulled up in the cast. You will see a deep crease above the heel as well posteriorly. You will see plantar flexion of all five metatarsals. You will see a deep crease in the sole of the foot and you will see a short uh, hyperextended toe, as you can see again in these clinical pictures. And why is this happening? Because the foot is not abducting through the subtalar joint at all and undue force is coming on the midfoot. So how do you tackle it? What is the consensus now? Since this was a well-recognized entity, first for a few days, give the child a cast holiday, stop casting till the great toe becomes normal. That cocked up great toe has to come back to normal. The skin has to come back to normal and the deep crease has to be a little less apparent. And then you start manipulation with a atypical club feet maneuver, which is a two thumb technique. And that's where you give pressure on the ball of the great toe and the fifth metatarsal. So you give simultaneous pressure only on the forefoot, leaving the midfoot and the hind foot alone. You have to be very gentle. Sounds very easy to show in pictures, but in real life, there is a big learning curve here as well. And then you gradually dorsiflex the forefoot before full abduction in each cast. So this has, you have to really be gentle. Uh, it's not easy in a crying baby, but once, once the abduction stops, here you have to modify your technique and do an early Achilles tenotomy. Once you finish the tenotomy, you may continue serial casting and once the deformity is fully corrected, you may require a modified foot abduction brace. What do we mean by a modified foot abduction brace? This is a set of club foot uh, feet where you, you can hardly make out now where the deep plantar crease was. So successfully treated with the atypical maneuver. I thank Sandeep Vaidya for this case. And what you do is then you don't set your limits of your abduction in the uh, foot abduction brace to. 70 degrees, as has been conventionally told, you accept it a little less, 40 or 60 degrees of abduction. Once that is done, you can get these kind of results with great looking supple feet. Another aspect of Ponsetti, which became not really controversial, but I would say discussed, is that if it is so successful in a neonate, can it be applied to older children? So when we look at older children, uh, they have a problems to, uh, you know, the unique set of problems, adherence to brace, uh, even if it's given only for nighttime, it's very difficult for a big child to sleep with a abduct, both a feet abducted and a bar over there. So instead, you have to use an AFO. You have to accept lesser degrees of abduction over there. Again, external rotation, which is tolerated as an infant at the thigh, is not tolerated as much in the older child. And you have to use synthetic or non-weight bearing walking cars for social reasons as well as for maintaining the dynamicity. We've written this up. 
in uh, the IGO for those of you who wish to read it. So we've applied it both to the walking aid children, which was a, not an indication which uh, Ponsetti originally described, and in non-idiopathic or syndromic club feet. The same method has been extended to them as we show you here. That's a six-year-old child with a very, very rigid club foot, and that's post-treatment. Again, pre-treatment and post-treatment in a very rigid, idiopathic but walking age club foot. What are the problems or the controversies for a syndromic club foot? It was thought that this is one place where Ponsetti technique simply cannot be applied because you have a very marked supination. The talus is extremely flexed and internally rotated, virtually in line with the tibia. And therefore, it was thought that it will be very resistant. The cast will fall off and you may not get more than great degrees of uh, abduction. That's a very, very rigid equinus. So these nomenclatures are now given up totally for uh, uh, severe or a complex club foot. And the term that is used is non-idiopathic club feet or syndromic club feet. Again, we need to adapt the technique, use uh, early tenotomy, emphasize on dorsiflexion, flexion, and cast should be greater than 90 degrees uh, flexion at the knee. It's a longer program. You expect a higher relapse rate. Very often in these children, you have to use limited posterior releases, but it reduces the extent or morbidity of subsequent surgery. And again, if you have arthrographic child with concomitant hip and knee contractures, you may need to use AFOs instead of the conventional foot abduction brace. Because finally, the goal is to get a plantar grade braceable foot in club feet. Some examples again for a Freeman Sheldon syndrome where we've used a limited uh, soft tissue release. Because the intrinsic nature of these soft tissues or muscles has a limited excursion. And hence, you can use serial casting, but you would have to do some little bit of surgery for the posterior element. Some typical examples again. So the consensus now is to use serial Ponsetti casting and then follow it up with limited surgery. Of course, expect a higher rate of relapse and make sure that the foot abduction brace, which is the most important reason, and non-adherence to foot abduction brace being the biggest reason for recurrence. Uh, we spend about a minute to discuss this. So here, I think foot abduction braces are as vital to uh, maintaining the correction as getting them. The role of counseling and follow-up is very, very important here. Failure to wearing braces uh, or adherence to wearing braces is the commonest complaint. And these are a number of excuses that the children, you know, parents will always give. But there are always solutions to each of these things. And I think if you really sit down with the parents and explain to them as to and help them tackle these problems, it's a journey where you have to co-travel with the parents, then you can easily navigate this. And it is, I think, behoves each surgeon to make sure that first four years of uh, your club foot treatment, your follow-up is really rigid and you make sure that the child adheres to the brace support. These are some of the things that I like to tell uh, the parents when they complain about a uh, child not accepting the foot abduction brace. And it always helps to show pictures or videos of some very, very comfortable patients. And that's when their family will accept it well. So this is something where uniformly consensus exists all over the world. That foot abduction brace of uh, the Steenbeek variety or many modifications exist. But basically, as long as the principles of external rotation and abduction are followed with a good degree of dorsiflexion uh, and the heel fitting into the heel cup, your results are usually good. So are we saying that it's completely eliminated any surgery? Uh, not really. So this is a short sort of algorithm that I would like uh, you all to remember that under two years of age, please start with serial casting first as described by Ponsetti. If not, uh, you know, uh, if it's resistant, it does not correct with uh, Ponsetti treatment, you can modify your maneuvers as shown before. But uh, if you have a recurrence, again, the beauty of Ponsetti is, and that's why it's almost like a panacea, that you could go back to uh, doing serial casting and you would probably get, uh, or even repeating a tenotomy, you would probably get as good results as you would have had you started primarily. Uh, how many minutes do we have more? Because I think we need to cover at least a bank. Dr. Monty. 
You can go on, man. Uh, okay. Just, you can yeah, go on, man. Uh, oh. So we'll just look at five minutes. Five minutes should be okay. Yeah, just that. Uh, you know, this was a co very commonly done surgery many years back. We used to have at least four or five PMRs every OT in Vadia, and now that is completely gone. So are we saying that PMR is completely wiped out, which is again controversial? Uh, not really. The consensus now exists that if there are syndromic associations or a, especially of the neurogenic variety, which is completely not responding to CAS, it is better to decide to go electively for surgery after a few, two or three CAS rather than getting or crushing the bones and having a flat top talus, which leads to considerable uh, problems in future and child is unable to dorsiflex and squat down. Sometimes in our country for pure economic and social indications for far off patients who come from, you know, maybe several kilometers away, some children who come from uh, other countries for medical tourism reasons. In the late presenting child also, sometimes for a supple foot or a preschool parents not consenting for cars, those cases you can use a, P a PMR. Or you have a failure of conservative management, especially hemimalias, or sometimes when you have tarsal coalition, there still is a role for PMR. So how it is done, just very few quick slides. This is the position that you should use so that the entire uh, calcaneopedal block is looking at you in your face and you can access posterior as well as medial and uh, easily. Those are the structures that you need to release. The tibialis posterior, you need to lengthen. The tendoachilles, you need to lengthen. The FHL you may tenotomize or lengthen if possible. Along with that, two joints that you need to uh, release are the uh, posterior capsule and the subtalar joint there. That's the TAZ lengthened ankle and subtalar. And that's your uh, FDL, which is shown here, the abductor hallux is brevis, which needs to be cut. Sorry, and that's your talonavicular joint also that you must open up. And that's the kind of correction you can get on table. If you still find the cavus persistent, do a plantar fasciotomy, lengthen all your tendons, and you can get beautiful corrections and results. If you find that there is a little stress on the skin here, you can do what was described from Vadia again by Dr. Aruji Satal, a trans fasciocutaneous flap and bring the uh, glabrous skin down so that you don't have this medial necrosis. And it can have excellent results if done well. You could use a Cincinnati technique or the you know Mackey's concept and go all the way laterally as well. Of course, this uh, the only controversy here is the approach to the TA where it's a little difficult to go in. But uh, uh, if you use serial casts and make sure that you undercorrect first and then follow up with a few casts, you get very good results with the Cincinnati technique as well, and you can heal that beautifully. And those are some of the uh, results of a. Uh, you know, well done PMR. Okay, I think we'll just leave uh, recurrence and all for questions. Yeah, I'll stop screen share and then depending on what answer you need, I'll take you to the respective slide. Thank you. Apu, Thank you. Very, very huge. And in 20 minutes, I, I think know. it was more better to focus on what is now the flavor of the season. I know. Uh, thank you, Rujita, for the uh, excellent presentation. We welcome uh, Dr. Asis Pandis. Uh, he's just, uh, I think, inside the theater with the theater <laughs> attire. <laughs> so that was a beautiful deliberation of uh, the, you know, Ponsari techniques and uh, how Kite's method was, uh, you know, there are some flaws in Kite's method and how Ponsari techniques helping. And uh, beautiful, we learned a lot, many, many things from there. Before I uh, hand over to the moderators, I have simple one or two questions which I'll ask from for what we ask the, normally during the postgraduate examination. And people are usually get confused that they don't not, not able to answer. The first question is that what we ask, what is the pronation and supination on the ankle and foot, which people usually get confused. Can you just little elaborate on that? What is that pronation and supination which you are talking about in ankle and foot? So uh, for a club foot, uh, what is important uh, is to uh, remember that the pronation at the forefoot is actually relative. So when you see it going inversion, when you remember the word so pin, so when you say in, you actually expect the forefoot to be, uh, you know, everted. 
it's a little uh, complex you have to read up the farabof's concept and the pathoanatomy but to balance the tripod since the i'll show it to in my own hands if the heel is in inversion the foot has to actually come out the forefoot has to come out in inversion to balance the tripod but in a club foot it is twisted so if you just simply imagine it as how it is uh, twisted therefore we say in a club foot the forefoot is in relative pronation to the hind foot mm. not a true uh, pronation and therefore that's why the first cast in ponsetti describes it as the worsening cast so the parents sometimes come back telling us that are to aur andar chala gaya but that is because you have to bring it into supination first only then it will align with the midfoot and then you can derotate it out and uh, thanks and uh, the second one is you know people usually get confused on the the splint stable what is the difference between dennis brown and stenbeck splint So, can you throw some light on the Dennis Brown splint? Is it being used, Dennis Brown? Now, Dennis it Brown is not it. really being used anymore. It was uh, a very rigid splint to begin with. It never took into account the uh, degree of abduction that is required uh, at both the feet. So, it was more or less like a fixed splint, and the bar in between was not adjustable. With a steel beak, you can actually bend it yourself. and uh, for a non uh, idiopathic club foot you can restrict the abduction to 40 degrees and for the uh, idiopathic variety you can again uh, increase it to 70 degrees uh, also the external rotation is adjustable there are many subsequent modifications of the steen beak and the other thing about between difference between dennis brown and steen beak is in the dennis brown shoe the if you this the tendo achilles the upper used to go right above the tendo achilles so every time the child tried to plant a flex they would get hurt over here and they would have a sore whereas in the uh, steen beak it is cut out well and it allows full dorsiflexion of the ankle oh, so it is great. more physiologically uh, designed for the neonate thanks thanks uh, now i hand over to shasha uh, for her questions discussion over to shasha please Ma'am, uh, ma'am, uh, if you could throw some light on uh, what is the consensus about prenatal diagnosis, ma'am, and uh, uh, if we diagnose CTV prenatally, then how would be what would be the next step in the management? Sure. So that's a slide I had put up, but then I think we decided to curtail the presentation a little bit. Um, antenatal diagnosis is becoming more and more uh, rampant or prevalent. I would say all over, uh, even in even in uh, tertiary, I mean, sort of district places and things like that, because of the universality of ultrasound. So, if it is detected right on in the first trimester itself, then you have to counsel them that this is more likely to be a syndromic association. if it is bilateral again that is a strong pointer that there might be a primary problem itself it may won't be just a packaging or a defect because of twin pregnancies or a small uterus or something like that so start looking for associated anomalies uh if you want to define it better you can ask them to go ahead and do an antenatal mri you can tell your uh, sonologist to look for the status of the knee joint and the hip joint if it's possible for them to visualize that very often we found that everything else is okay but one of the knee is hyperextended and if that is so then you have to suspect orthogryposis and other syndromes but if everything else is fine if it comes to light more in the uh, second or third trimester then very likely it's going to be either just a postural club foot or a simple supple idiopathic club foot and uh, alerting the uh, parents to all the possibilities and telling them at from the word go that whatever it is a club foot is treatable and treatable very easily in the open that is very important because the amount of stress that it causes to the parents i have had well to do patients who've come to me saying i don't want a baby with a problem so this is non lethal this is fully treatable and therefore the delicate balance of uh, pushing the parents towards the uh, mpp you know the onus really becomes on the doctor so you must counsel them of the entire spectrum 
but at the same time tell them it is treatable and it is treatable in a very very simple way and we will look into further details because again you have to keep yourself medical legally safe so the consensus is to really put forth the entire picture to them in such a humane way that they get encouraged to kind of go ahead with the pregnancy and then uh, get the treatment done at the right time thank you ma'am over to rama please any question from your side uh, ma'am i have a few questions in case of unilateral cases uh, we will we, start with casting startingly but uh, after uh, if it is not uh, correcting with the positive then we will go back and if we check with mri then we will find some spinal dysrhythm closed one actually in at what stage we, we should advise mri to those unilateral cases ma'am so that's good to be a little bit uh, uh, for rarity to find a uh, spinal dysrhythm which were which had no external signs to begin with so when you examine a club foot i mean i didn't go into too much of a typical clinical examination and all that you must make sure that you strip the baby and every club foot screen for other anomalies the two commonest ones being your ddh and your spina bifida however there will always be some telltale signs when you are doing your ponsetti and if it is not responding uh, for example your abduction just not going beyond a certain extent and the suppleness of i mean with each plaster the amount of correction that you notice so if that itself is showing rigidity then you counsel the parents and tell them that this is not looking if something is not correct starting to abduct after three casts also then you would alert them to the possibility uh, that there might be some other reason that you need to look into which may have not been apparent at uh, birth mri rarely because again that is something which again requires uh, uh, anesthesia so that would be in a older child i would say so but if you're dealing with a neonate in the first one and a half months to two months almost even the spinal cartilage is quite uh, soft so it is uh, easy to uh, detect on sono anatomy as well so my routine prescription to the sonologist whenever i send them for a hip screening is please screen the spine as well so they can actually at least the lower 3 4 vertebra the uh, low lumbar vertebra they can screen with the spine and tell us if there's anything if that looks suspicious yeah then i order an mri fair enough okay. but otherwise i would be very hesitant to order an mri in a new unit Uh, you have seen various reasons for bracing at night counseling so many reasons the mm-hmm. uh, parents will tell us that the child is not keeping brace whole night how what uh, actually exactly how you will counsel those parents ma'am so the first thing i do is before i begin i tell them that every part of this club foot treatment is non negotiable number 1 number 2 i tell them that this is a joint exam my exam will get over the day i put the child in the braces because correcting a foot is the easiest part is what i tell them and i tell them that you have to mentally prepare yourself for the next 4 years that no matter what happens you won't let the recurrence happen so little bit they get the ownership of that of course you don't abandon them with that but uh, another way i like to also counsel them is that you know don't let the child train you into what he wants he or she wants you train the child into accepting a foot abduction brace so if the skin has been really kept well you know if they don't put the foot abduction brace exactly on day as soon as the plaster is out the skin is still irritated red erythematous painful and sensitive and you just put the brace on this child will just keep howling and the first emotional impact of that is parents will just remove the brace yes. so i tell them just wait for a day just use some moisturizer emollients let the skin breathe it has been inside plasters for so long once the child is in a good mood and sleeping that's when you put it on start with the difficult leg first if it's a bilateral uh, there's a we all know that there are differences between unilateral and bilateral even two feet in the uh, same child may be one may be more supple one may be less supple so start with the bilateral uh, more difficult one and both parents have to be involved they can't just push it on to the mother which is what just uh, tends to happen in indian families so the father has to flex the knee hold it down put, hold it in corrected position 
slip the shoe on. They're actually now newer braces where it's just still like a steam beep, but modified in such a way that you just make the shoe, uh, put the shoe onto the child first and then attach the bar. Dobbs has and many others and many, many names. I won't really get into those, but they are making it easier and easier for uh, the foot abduction brace to be worn. So really speaking, if it's a disciplined parent, uh, shouldn't be a problem. But yeah, you will always get some who will come back and tell you that the baby is not keeping it. So. Yeah. What are your thoughts on uh, accelerated ponsetty, ma'am? Accelerated ponsetty. Great, great you... question. Great question, Priya. So when all these reverse ponsetty, accelerated ponsetty uh, is more of terms which came along the way as people yes, started you... changing it to suit themselves. Most of them were practical or socio-economic reasons. Uh, that if the child simply cannot stay for you that long, then the earliest you should or the shortest interval you should keep between them is five days, four to five days, because it takes at least four to five days for the crimps or the baby collagen to mature. And if that, that much time is not given, it will not retain your correction that well. One, two is it will be too traumatic for the parents and the ch child to go through, uh, take out the plaster within two days. Again, you have to you know put one plaster and, so we all know how irritating it is to keep dipping your feet in water and take it. Although that's a better way rather than cutting the plaster. But uh, these are not easy journeys for a family who is just, you know, handling a neonate. So five days is, I think, the best uh, short period. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for answering my question. Yeah, Captain Nitish, uh, your uh, first question. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the wonderful uh, uh, presentation on this. Uh, I think you have answered my, most of my doubts, but then I have few questions, practical questions that I am uh, facing in my practice. Uh, ma'am, uh, you have, uh, you are working on a, a prospective study, uh, when to do TA tenotomy and when to do TA learning. I am uh, really forward to looking onto that article when it will be uh, published. So uh, at no, present, do not uh, mean older children. Complete TNA yes, not mean older children, not in yes, children. Uh, do not mean older children. So at present, uh, uh, for my practice, what I'm doing is I'm doing TA not me up to five years. And then after that, I'm doing TA lending. So I hope because these articles are still uh, there up to yeah. five years. Yeah. So um, uh, I'm really looking forward to that article where. So at what, up till what age, ma'am, you are doing uh, uh, TA lending in your uh, sorry, in your, uh, we've done a max up to the age of 10. Okay. But again, it's case to case dependent. So if you feel that after serial correction, your hind foot equinus is really very rigid, then you okay. shouldn't have a thought block and say that, no, I'll do only a complete teatinotomy. If you need to do, then you can add a posterior release along with that. Okay. But most, the mean age of that study was again, more shifted towards six years, eight years. Uh, Matthew Verghese from Delhi has even done up to 20 years, he says. Okay. But I think beyond 10 years, uh, there are hardly any papers which have shown the continuity. So I would say 5 to 6 is a good age. 10 is what has been our upper limit as of yet. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, ma you have been in the literature also says that 85% of the patients require tenotomy. Uh, those 15% of the patients which don't require tenotomy because of the supple equinus, which is easily correctable. But I have seen a uh, few of those patients over a period of time, they tend to uh, develop equinus deformity, which is rigid. And if they are not corrected, they develop a midfoot break. So uh, how to tackle with those midfoot break? Because the patients are not on follow-up regularly once it is corrected. And then they finally land it up with midfoot break. Yeah, so, uh, uh, it's a very good question again. So deciding when not opting for the tenotomy should not be based on just the clinical appearance. A small baby with chubby feet, with the if you're scoring it regularly, and if your Pirani score is showing 0.5 or 1, for the if you have the empty heel sign, please don't hesitate to do a tenotomy. Okay. It may look plantigrade, but you have to really feel and see where your calcaneus is. One. Two is... If you're really in doubt, you could use a simple lateral x-ray and see yeah. whether the talus enlarge has really shifted back into the socket of the ankle mortis or no. If it yeah. is still way out, then just again, go ahead and just do the tenotomy. 
So okay. I would say, I mean, uh, you know, statistics and literature and all is very relative. Um, depends on your sample size. Yes, but ma'am. up to now, I have never regretted doing a T8 in autonomy, even when I thought that this is looking, oh, this is looking so good just now. So this is all short-lived joys. Yes, Later ma'am. on, you have uh, things to deal with. Yes, ma'am. And ma'am, how do you manage these foot, mid-foot break? Because I found very uh, less uh, evidence base in mid-foot break. Mid-foot um, break, again, is a more or less like a skew foot or like you created a rocker bottom. Yes, so you sometimes need to go back and do the uh, Dobbs oh. technique, recreate your deformity, give yes, a cast holiday first of all, recreate your deformity and then start all over again. Maybe you may need to use the atypical technique maneuver, yes, but monitor it a little more in detail. Okay. And um, um, uh, third thing is, uh, there are a few patients who have done a tenotomy before and then they require revision tenotomy. So would you go proximal or distal to the previous tenotomy? So, I would go uh, proximal. You will go proximal, ma'am. Rather so, than cutting the uh, fibrotic tendon, I would look for a clear plane and do that. And uh, there have been instances where people have gone distal and sliced into the cartilage instead. Okay. So, so that's again go. something very dangerous because the talus has already moved in. So. And one more last question regarding bracing in a, a relatively elder child after two years, three years walking age group because they are not able to um, suppose they have come as a untreated club foot after two years or a complicated club foot like a rocker bottom feet and we are we have done the management now we have started the bracing so uh, and these are walking child they'll not be able to tolerate 23 hours uh, uh, foot abduction brace so we give AFO in a walking uh, morning and then uh, night time with the foot abduction brace so that AFO should be a ma'am a static brace or a articulated AFO sort of thing How, what do you recommend ma'am so firstly, uh, you don't recommend 23 hours of bracing to an older child at all. It is just completely impractical. You say night and nap time to begin with. If they really accept that up to the age of two, three years, this may still be possible. Four years and beyond, they really don't. Yes, so begin with a static AFO to retain your correction. Start with a little bit of manipulation physio is also what I say. And then once you see that the child has good control, once you see that the peronia are really recruiting by checking the child, making him squat down and the heel is still touching down in uh, squatting, then you can move on to a dynamic or articulated AFO. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for a wonderful talk. So I think we are almost completing one hour. Uh, it's been really been an eye-opener for me personally because being an orthoplasty surgeon for a Many, many years I have not heard about CTV. And, yeah. But being a postgraduate teacher and being an examiner, I need to know in and out of CTV as well. So it uh, really added to my knowledge and I'm sure all the viewers must have been gained from your extensive experience about uh, CTV. Thank you, Rujita, for being here with us today and deliberating your uh, you know controversy and consensus about CTV. And uh, we also thank all our uh, moderators, um, Shasha, Priya, and Anitis, uh, and just uh, to clarify some of the doubts and uh, also just um, make us uh, enlightened about the club food details about club food. So before closing, I hand over to Dr. Asis Pandis uh, just to conclude, give concluding remarks, and I close this session. Over to Asis, please. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, good evening, ma'am. I'm so sorry to join in late. But I would like to conclude before uh, before conclusion. I would like to ask one sort of uh, not a philosophical question, but we uh, being for a non pediatric orthopedic surgeon and general orthopedic surgeon, I would just like to know if we have arrived at a consensus at a lot of uh, on a lot of issues. Are there any controversies that you foresee in the future in the management of club foot? You know, we as arthroplasty surgeons tend to keep on digging up more and more controversies as we go on understanding more about the artificial joint. But in terms of club foot, now that we have heard you over the last 45 minutes, are there any thoughts for the future? Where the next controversy is going to come from or where the next thrust of research is going to be? The thrust of research or controversy uh, is hot still in terms of the basic sciences. Because, you know, despite years and centuries of, you know, dealing with club foot, the exact cause and what leads to this has not been uh, uh, determined yet. And that will go us, it will get us back to the womb because practically everything else we have, you know, thrashed out, even fixators and 
osteotomies, telectomies. I mean, I didn't really go into the surgical aspect at all as uh, much as I would have liked to. Maybe that could be a separate session because that's a huge chapter in itself. But taking us back into the womb, will there be something antenatally in terms of intervention? Will there be a, a molecular biology intervention or gene therapy? Like few years back, it was so I'll just draw a simile. We used to think that uh, the minute the child walks in and shows you a gower sign, and we used to literally sit with our heads, oh God, I don't know what to say and how to break the bad news onto this patient. Mm -hmm. That now, at, at the moment, there is already a new drug, a new drug, drug trial going on in India, which is claiming to completely delete the gene which causes Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So hopefully if that really comes up someday and if we are able to really nab it, then I think going back into the womb and intervening in some way and maybe giving it some sky fi that we can think of that, you know, you just give an injection and the thing will turn around and the club will become abducted. Excellent. Thank you very much, ma'am. And always a pleasure to uh, listen to your talk. And uh, I would thank uh, uh, Sasha, Dr. Arora, uh, and uh, even my colleague, Dr. Deepak Gautam for uh, being here today. And thank you very much Priya. to all the uh, viewers. So I hope Priya. you all enjoyed this uh, and Dr. Priya as well. And uh, to the viewers, I hope you enjoyed this. And if you have any questions, please drop them in the comment box and we will sure uh, check it. And uh, I would also like you to welcome in the next few weeks about the next controversy to consensus that we will be conducting. Uh, thank you very much and have a good night. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. And thank you to Ortho TV as always for being a backbone and support. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Punam and uh, Dr. Ashok Sham and uh, Dr. Niraj Bijlani for being there. Yeah. Thank you, Punam. Now you can uh, you know, stop the live streaming. Okay, sir.